Okay, so before you start carving your wax, just to soften the wax a little bit, because depending on the type of wax that you're using, some of the waxes are really hard, like the one that we have here, which is great for carving and, and really creating some natural contours. So one way around it, just to get the initial carving a little bit easier, what I like to do is take my alcohol torch and just gently flame over around the margins. Well, there's no margins there yet, but there will be. You don't have to go all the way across because it'll probably cool off by the time you get there. So just heat up the side or warm up the side that you're gonna start off with. I'm right-handed, so therefore I typically start on the first quadrant and make my way across, okay? Might be a good idea to anchor the case up against your tabletop and start carving around the teeth. So your initial carving is going to be a little bit longer than where your final carving is going to be. So I'm not necessarily going all the way to the cervical notch. And my interdental papilla is not necessarily halfway up the uh, halfway up the tooth. It's all the way to the occlusal third versus the middle third of the tooth. Okay. I can already sense the wax just cool, cooling off a little bit, so I'm just going to heat up the next little section that I'm going to work with, usually about three or four teeth at a time. So you can carve the wax just like so, or you can carve starting from the occlusal third, come down to the cervical third, and then maybe turn the case around if that's a little bit easier for you to control the spatula. Okay. I'll do the same thing on the canine. So basically, if you can do one tooth, you're pretty much uh, good to go for the rest of them. So I think I'll take it all the way to the midline and maybe introduce some more heat just to soften the wax. So depending on the type of the wax that you use, typically the harder the wax, the easier it is to carve the wax off the teeth. So the amount of tooth that I've exposed here is a little bit shorter than where eventually we're going to end up. Okay. One thing to keep in mind as you're working through your wax up is that we need to expose the undercut areas of the tooth on the labial and lingual surfaces. And a big reason for that is obviously to create a, ni a nice natural appearance and also to ensure that the teeth are retained in our investment when we boil out. So we don't end up losing teeth during our investment process. I'm tentatively holding the case up against the model. As you recall previously, I soaked the model, so this can easily be removed. Not a problem. So. I just going to work with it on the model. And I like soaking the, the cast versus using separator because a separator tends to leave a little film behind. Soaking it in water will give you a cleaner result. It's, uh, it makes it a whole lot easier when the wax has completely cooled off. So once you apply your wax, try not to carve it right away. You're just gonna be end up displacing the wax around versus carving it. 
I tend to have just the uh, a toothbrush as well, a soft bristle brush, fine point bristles, just to kind of remove some of the wax off as I'm carving around it. On the lingual side, I want to expose enough wax or enough tooth surface, I should say. Now, depending on the brand of tooth that you're using, some teeth have a, a longer lingual surface than others. So I try to expose as much as you can and try to keep it uniform. One thing we don't want to do is to create a trench infect. So we don't want to create pits in our margins. There's no way around it around the lingual side. I have to come from the occlusal aspect. But eventually I'm going to turn this case over and carve it this way to eliminate the little trench that I created in there with my initial carving. Okay, but initially, I can't help it. I have to work around it. This one, I want to create a bit of a scalloped look here around the cingulums of the teeth. And I think it makes it easier for the initial carving to have the tip of your number seven spatula, or whatever tool you, that you're gonna end up using, rather dull. This is not a very fine instrument as we compare it to something like this when I end up doing my final carving that's a whole lot sharper than the number seven that I'm using now you notice that when I did the carving on the facial side I did not carve it from the approaching it from the occlusal. I carved it approaching it from the cervical third. So what we want to create is about a 45 degree angle with that ledge that we're creating so we don't create any food traps there. Okay. Okay, so that looks pretty good. Now I have an idea where I'm going with this. And possibly at this point, if you realize that you don't have enough wax added, you wanna go back, you might wanna go back and flow some more wax. But I think I do. So I'm gonna keep going with it. And I'm gonna carve a little bit lower now, just to expose a little more of a tooth surface. I think you'll find it easier if you anchor the case to your bench and your hands to the case. So this is anchored to the bench and everything else is anchored to the, either the model or the mounting here. So I'm not looking for a great deal of accuracy at this point. I just want to get a general sense where I'm going with this. And I have to say this wax is, is rather hard compared to some other waxes. It makes it a little more challenging to do the initial carving, but I think you'll appreciate the fact of a, of a nice hard wax when it comes to the finish of the denture because you can create some very accurate contours here and especially <clears throat> around the margins because really that's where you want to have a very nice clean wax up to eliminate any possible trimming after investing around the margins because it's very difficult to polish that area. going to brush some of the filings off and go back on the lingual side and what I'm going to do on the lingual side now being my second pass at this 
Instead of approaching it from the occluso, I'm gonna approach it almost at a slant here. So I'm gonna take my number seven spatula and see if I can feather that little ledge that I created so I don't eliminate, so I can eliminate all those little pits. So I'm creating a, a very much tapered effect all the way to the tooth surface. And of course, I'm gonna carve that further with some of the finer instruments a little bit later. And the lingual side of the upper and lower denture is, is really the most difficult one to trim and polish. So I tend to take a bit of an extra care here to make sure that I do the best that I can to eliminate any trimming when this turns into acrylic. Okay, getting closer to where we want to be. So at this point, you can take a possibly a Lacron carver or the back of your number seven spatula. to uh, start creating some of the anatomy. Just trying to find one of my instruments, which I'm missing right now, but that's okay. So I'm gonna start again from this side and work my way across versus this way because I have to rest my fingers as I'm working through the case. Remember that there's a concavity into approximately. There's a concavity. And there's a slight distal inclination of the root forms that we're trying to create. Okay? So we have a concavity. We have a bit of a distal inclination, which I'm exaggerating a little bit here just to prove the point. And also we have a concavity between the gingival roll, which is about three to four millimeters around the margin, and eventually the periphery roll. So we're gonna have a concavity running along the length of the denture here, this way. And we have concavities into approximately. And if we do it correctly, it should um, contour the root forms of the teeth as if they were there. So I'm gonna start over here. And as I work my way across, I'm thinking of creating a little depression between the periphery roll and the gingival roll below each tooth. And at the same time, a much deeper depression into approximately. And that will start creating or shaping the root form of the tooth. And this is where you really start appreciating uh, hard wax, because you can get some uh, very fine carving as far as this is concerned. It works, I think, in my opinion, it works better when you're using a hard um, modeling wax versus a rather soft one. 
The thickness of the margins should be about a millimeter or a millimeter and a half, depending on the size of the case or depending on the size of the teeth that you're using. A relatively smaller mold will require about a millimeter thickness of a margin and something larger, closer to a millimeter and a half. Very important to make sure that we tapered the interdental papilla towards the interproximal as to not to create a ledge or a step there. And I'm actually tapering the wax towards the tooth as I approach the margin. You can certainly use your number seven to do this, but I find that the number seven is rather large to be able to carve the wax into approximately. So you're probably better off, I think, with your Lacron carver doing this initially. So once again, there's a depression between the periphery roll and the gingiva roll under each tooth, and a deeper depression into approximately to shape the, the root forms of the teeth and to create a nice natural look and, a, and feel for the patient. So once I get my initial carving going, I'm gonna do this all the way across And I'm going to go back and redefine my, my margins. Remember around, under the canine here, we have, we try to simulate the canine eminence, which is a rather bulky type of appearance of the root form of the tooth. So you might want to leave it a little bit wider than anything else to exaggerate the corner of the mouth. So I think what I'll do, I'm going to take it uh, all the way to the midline and just to compare the before and after of the initial carving and the final carving. So once again, pay attention to the thickness of the margins as you're carving your wax to make sure that it's consistent for all the teeth. And if I have any residue of wax on top of the teeth now, I'm just gonna take my instrument and gently wipe it off. That looks pretty good. And then now I'll come back to the lingual side and carve towards the tooth once again. If the case allows and if it's big enough, you want, want to create, again, like we did on the facial side, you want to create a bit of a bigger depression into approximately to give it that natural appearance. and the natural feel. So we don't want to have a ledge in here. We want the wax to taper towards the tooth. We don't want to create depressions or little trenches, so to speak, to possibly create food traps. And the self-cleansing effect 
that you create with your, with your dentures when they're finished really starts now. It doesn't start when you start trimming them or polishing them. It starts now with a proper wax up. And once again, I'll take it to the midline. And I'll do the rest off camera. And we'll revisit and do a little review on the wax up. I find that the harder the wax, uh, it has more of a shine to it. And I'm able to assess the contours a little bit better as the light reflects back into my eye. So for a number of reasons, I think a hard wax will make it easier to do this part of the, of the work. That looks okay. So what I'm going to do next, I'm going to further define the margins around the teeth. And once again, when you do the margins on the facial side, you want to make sure that you're approaching from the cervical. We're not going to turn the case this way and start digging in, therefore creating food traps. So the teeth are kind of facing away from you. So now with a very fine instrument of your choice, I'm going to carve around the tooth and I'm also kind of creating a feel, trying to find that margin incorporated by the manufacturer around that tooth. Go back and scrape the excess. And as you're working from one tooth to another, just make sure that the interdental papilla is no higher or no lower than about halfway up the tooth. Ideally, the interdental papilla should fill in the space below the contact area of proximal surfaces. And as I'm doing this, if you've noticed, I start from the occlusal third or halfway up the tooth as I'm getting a little bit closer to it. And as I get down to the margin, cervical margin, I should say, I turn my case over. And this allows me to maintain the same carving configuration, right? I'm always carving towards me. I think you'll have more control of your instrument carving towards you than having to carve away from you at this point. I would have to do this motion to carve. But you can simply turn the model over and continue carving towards you, which I think is a little bit better in terms of maintaining control than carving away from you. And as I expose a little more tooth this time around, it becomes evident that my margins are a little bit on the thick side, which is okay. I can simply go back and carve them again, just like I did previously. So once again, I'm going to start at the interdental papilla, work my way down to the cervical third of the tooth, turn the case over, and carve again to the interdental papilla or interdental space. Stop there. Turn it over. And carve away. 
Notice that my hand position on the instrument itself. I'm not holding it from here. Typically using my third finger, my middle finger I should say, to hold the instrument, but my finger is relatively close to the tip because this will take a lot of pressure to carve through the wax. So I'm not holding it all the way up here at the handle. My third finger is all the way down here. The rest of my hand anchors on the model and I'm carving around the tooth. So I'm just gonna go back and redefine this a little bit. And as I do, I'm exposing a little more tooth surface. In hindsight, I think I've added a little bit too much wax to carve away. But that's not a big deal. We can always carve that back. Okay, so I'm gonna go back with my Lacron carver and reestablish the thickness of the margins here as they appear a little bit on the thick side. And as I do so, I taper the margin towards the tooth. You can hear the instrument hitting the tooth somewhat. Maintain a uniform thickness of the margins. Now redefine the gingival roll and the periphery roll by incorporating a little concavity between the two and a bit of a deeper depression into approximately. And while doing so, you wanna create a slight little distal inclination of the root forms that you're creating to give it a nice natural look. Avoid carving the interdental papilla too low. And what, because what you're gonna end up having is a pit into approximately, which create a lot of food traps. And it's very difficult for the patients to clean their dentures as they're working their way through the meal. And it doesn't create a very good self-cleansing effect. On the other hand, we don't want the interdental papilla to be too high. So it's a fine line that we're walking here, but eventually we'll find it. Wipe some of that off. And now I can go back on the lingual side and further clean up the margins here. So again, with a bit of a sharper tool now, I can go in here and clean this up a little bit more. Make sure that you don't have any wax on the occlusal surfaces of the teeth. and scrape off any excess wax on the teeth surface. Okay, so from this point, before I go any further, it's starting to take shape. You can see here the contours 
after the initial carving. It almost looks like the root forms here along the buckle corridor. But before I go any further, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take a little bit of gauze with some wax remover and wipe off the fine wax residue remaining on the teeth. For the interior teeth, you really want to pinch them together with your gauze and just wipe across them. Try not to push them one way or another. Wipe any, any wax off the occlusal surface of the teeth as well on the lingual ledge that you created here. And just go back and clean that up a little bit. And of course you would do this all the way around, but I'm gonna stop at the midline just to compare. So at this point, if you've done it, when you've done it all the way around, you can remove the case and use your font stock to remove that little ledge that's overlapping the land area. Make sure that you don't get any wax shavings under the base plate. So that little ledge that, that's left behind, I'm just gonna smooth that out with my font stock. I'm going to define the Freno attachment. There's one right here. So you can initially carve it with your surgical blade, possibly. or you can melt some of it away. Try not to use a lot of heat when you do this with your number seven spatula if you have a hard time doing it with your blade. Either way will work. I like using my blade initially to carve it. Make sure that it's tapered on either side and it's rounded. Nothing about a denture should be straight or sharp. Everything should be rounded. So your frenal attachment relief should look like something like that. So when I place it back on my cast, and if we go back, before I do so, if we go back and identify our frenum, frenal release, uh, relief here, or at least our frenum, I should say, I'll do this with a colored pencil. So there's a hint of the freedom there. So when I place my wax up on top of it, I should be able to see a bit of a hint of it underneath it, just a slight relief, okay? All right, so I'm also going to possibly scrape some of the wax that might have creeped under the base plate if we had excess relief. when we're fabricating the base plate, but that looks pretty good. I'm gonna gently flame the periphery so it looks and feels like the finished product. I'm gonna place it back on the cast And I'm going to gently flame my wax up.
So hold your, your mm -hmm. alcohol torch relatively close to your wax up. Try not to hold it too far away, otherwise you have to squeeze it a lot and it creates a lot of heat at the tip. So hold it relatively close and I think will work out very well. This is not to say that this is done. It looks okay, but I'm definitely gonna have to go back and carve some more and clean up the margins some more. Okay, which I will show you in the next video.